Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. You have got three guests with you today um, and this is going to be a really fun podcast. Again, hopefully you know who AJ Morris is from last time. Um, most of the <laughs> listeners to this show, I think, are kind of like your loyal listeners. You've been listening since episode one or something, so I think you'll probably know who AJ is um, or if you keep up with my content, you'll know who AJ Morris is and he is also in his contest prep. And you'll also know he always wears uh, caps which is this is our uh, our welcoming to AJ into the the podcast wearing our caps if you're watching on YouTube um baseball caps back backwards uh, is the is the the way the AJ Morris crew go so anyway um let me get into talk it we're going to talk to AJ kind of ask bad intro how, how have the last few weeks gone um, and then we will kind of get into a discussion in which we're thinking about talking about probably body fat distribution, how it changes over a career, what implications it could have for a bodybuilder trying to get to kind of contest lean levels. Um, but yeah, first of all, let's get into how have the last few weeks been for AJ. It's been quite a while since we've had you on the podcast. So a lot has changed. Um, mm. Yeah. How have they gone, AJ? Kind of body weight. How's that been going? Leanness levels. How are you feeling? Are you feeling ready? Um, just a general mm -hmm. kind of summary of what's happening and we'll get some kind of follow-on questions, no doubt. Cool. Yeah, no, guys, thank you very much for having me. I was literally like last night, I think I was listening to the most recent episode and you know that I'm a fan. I've always been a fan of this one because I think it's, it's something that's just very individual. Like you don't listen to another podcast that's like this. And I, I, you know, I'll be honest, I don't catch every single one of your other ones. I catch the ones that are interesting and I catch the ones that I'm personally like really wanting to listen to. Uh, but I do listen to avidly. I listen to every one of these because they're very enjoyable and I can relate to them because I'm prepping as well, as you know. Uh, so where was I at last time? I think, I don't know, I think it was like at least five weeks ago. So definitely some time has gone by and some progress has been made. And I think, you know, the last time we spoke, everything was going pretty decently. Like, fat loss was coming without too much of a push. There wasn't sort of any worries with regards to where I was at or any sort of doubts, I don't think. I think fairly soon after that, I had a week where I was really full of self-doubt. And I know that Pascal has talked about this quite a lot with the sort of the feeling of, am I ready? Have I got the readiness for the stage that I wanted? Or do I feel like I've got enough muscle? And I think this came alongside because I had one of my close friends that, you know, knew you and Pascal are very close. So it's, it's kind of a similar situation. I had one of my close friends, Jack, who we decided, and I coached Jack, so it's even more personal. We decided that it wasn't the best time for him to compete and that he was going to take some more time out to build some more muscle. And I think that's a very, very uh, wise idea and very sort of like adult idea of him to have. And first up, like he was the one that sort of instigated that chat. I, from a coaching perspective, took it on board and thought, okay, right, you know, this is, this is a situation we can, we can, we can manage. And if he's game to sort of stop the process and go into, into a massing or a gaining phase, then, then that's what we need to do, especially if his heart wasn't totally in it. So I guess that kind of had an effect on me because he was so close and we we're going through the process together. So then I sort of had a bit of self doubt. I also, I think, soon after the podcast or maybe around the podcast it was like body power weekend body power went really really well obviously with my client andrew and i actually came back from body power and anytime i go to a show i think this is something cool for the listeners to to realize is that going to shows if you're like passionate about bodybuilding that's like the number one thing you can do to keep motivation levels up Every time I go to a show, I come back more motivated, more motivated. And the week, the week following watching a bodybuilding show is a piece of piss. It really is because I'm, I'm so motivated by the show that I don't, I don't even think about hunger. I don't even think about the tired, draggy feet. I just think about, I want to get on stage and that's the goal. It's like, it just brings back the hyper-focus goal again. It's like when you finish a prep and you haven't got it anymore overeating becomes such an easy thing to do because you haven't got that control anymore it's lost so 
yeah, after body power, the motivation came back, the self-doubt went away, and I started to make sort of quite significant progress again in terms of uh, body fat loss and scale weight loss. So I think, you know, since since we lost, but I maybe had one week which was a bit stalled, and all the other weeks were fairly good in terms of hitting both a new low within the week and the average coming down as well. With that, I've seen good physique changes in the mirror and in the photos. So I do tend to share some progress images on Instagram. I do tend to share those ones that are taken. And this is just the highlight reel again. I do tend to share the ones that are taken post-workout on an upper body day on a Saturday after my refeed. So if anything, in those ones, I'm looking like the best. And I'm always like, I'm honest about that. But I do take ones which are just over here, actually, where I've got huge double slider doors, which is like a huge window of light coming in. So it's light and then me. And I look pale as fuck. And those are the ones where I sort of... (laughs) Yeah, those are the ones which I use to analyze progress, take them on my mobile the whole time. haven't actually tried my camera yet, but I know that Steve takes his on video. But I just take them every week as well. And those are all heading in the right direction and like we we sort of had a brief chat before we came on like we said you know body fat distribution is a topic that we might cover my lower body just doesn't look like it belongs to me right now because (laughs) (laughs) my upper body is like so diced i will i i I like if i'm in the gym and my forearms up to like my mid bicep are showing like people are like holy shit you look really lean and I'm like, yeah, I like and my upper body is lean, but my legs aren't. And they'll even see my legs and they'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, fair enough. You're not that, not like that lean all over. But I will be because I know that it happens. And with regards to like when I see a new low or when the average comes down, I just, I almost immediately see that is a ch- as a change in my lower body, whether that's feeling my hamstring, like hit, I, hit, I always hit like rear double bicep where my legs like back. And I feel my hamstring, I feel my glute, and like I can feel almost every time that every week there's a slight change in terms of how that actually feels to the touch, which I think is another good variable to measure when you're dieting. Is like how do things feel to the touch, not just images, scale weight. Like, does it feel? Does it feel different? Does it feel like there's the extra detail or or mm-hmm. condition there? Um, so. Yeah, it's, it's mainly at this stage, everything is going well and it's just about sort of continuing to lose weight. And, and finally, obviously, the, the third sort of thing is training uh, and training like just again is, is going superb. I'm very, I'm very close to probably a, a deload within the next one to two weeks, but it's not something that I feel right now. Wow, I really need a deload. So I think I can go for another one to two weeks and then take an actual cautious deload which i don't often do i normally just push it until i'm completely fried and then take one um which but i but i don't want to do that this time i actually really care really care about longevity um mm-hmm. because i've been hurt i've got niggles and i just hate them i hate them more than deloading so i want to deload when i need to and also i've there's a few movements that i've sort of looked at and thought okay there's a, there's a better way to do this and there's a there's a way that better suits me as a bodybuilder. And I think that's probably something that I really took home from following Mike's content more religiously and going to the seminar and coming back from that was sort of like a bit more of a, a rounded opinion on, on form and how we apply that to us ourselves as bodybuilders and uh, also follow, following a lot of Jared Feathers stuff. And sort of, I had a few back-to-back conversations with him on Instagram that that sort of fed my mind with the idea that I can do some movements a little bit better than I was currently doing them. Mm-hmm. So that's been super helpful. But for the most part, like things staying pretty consistent with training, not much has changed. Just stuff retaining or slight progression, mainly progression on lower body and retaining on my pushes where I can with, with definitely regression since bulking numbers, but mainly retention uh, and then pulling movements again, slight bits of progression where I can, uh, but mostly retention on, on numbers there. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much a roundup guys. Yeah. That's where I'm at. Cool. 
I mean, <clears throat> you've brought up so many interesting points there. And one mm. which really stuck with me was the point of being motivated and getting some external motivation in to stay on track and to keep pushing yourself hard and not fall off the wagon or make any sure. uh, severe changes which might be detrimental in the long run. Mm. Um, I mean, you you mentioned that as things like the body power or watching bodybuilding shows always motivate you, but are mm. there any kind of other motivators in your life which help you push through the dark days or dark times or when you are having self-doubts about the whole process uh, which help you yeah sure that's a good question i think the social media side of things certainly helps me because i and i posted this in one of my like your group uh, sort of like a big facebook group with lots of people in it that are like-minded i posted about sort of stress and actually no it wasn't stress it was pressure like how do you handle pressure do you like it or do you not like it and i really like pressure um, and i actually know i know for a fact that there's going to be quite a few people that have an expectation of me and have an idea in their heads that i've created <laughs> of <laughs> me of me bringing good conditioning because i brought what was considered pretty good conditioning for a you know uh 18 uh 19 year old bodybuilder as a teen and the the step up is a junior and and that there's there should be a step up not in terms of just muscularity but also there should be an improvement in my condition because there could have been in 2015 i just didn't have the muscularity to go with it so there is always this idea in the back of my head that when i step on that stage people are literally going to be waiting for me to show improvements obviously it's not the same like uh, someone stepping on the stage at olympia they have huge expectations huge fans and huge followers and you know i just have a small nick cube community of of awesome people that feel like they they want to be a part of the journey and they expect things and i'm sure that it's the same for steve and yourself like there's an expectation for you as a coach to perform and to elicit a response as a result of your actions that are supposedly optimal because we do a lot of work to make things optimal like we're chasing this optimal environment for a prep and whilst we do things differently all between us three like we're still chasing the best version of ourselves and wanting to put that on stage totally. so i really like the pressure element i i really respond well to that and I like putting the pictures up because I like it when someone comments saying, when your lower body comes in, you'll look great. And I'm like, some people could take that the wrong way and think, oh, well, my lower body looks fat. Fuck this. Let's eat cake. And like, I don't take it that way. I, I take it as a, as, a, as a point that I'm going to prove when I put up a striated glute shot. And people are like, well, yeah, you actually worked hard and you actually got lean. And, you know, whether that's the goal or not, you know, I'm not saying that that's the goal. It's just... I want to be the best that I can be and, and the pressure of the social media aspect is good. And also with social media, it's like I I know a few guys that potentially I will be competing against and occasionally seeing them pop up in my feed. Like I like that a lot. I, I love that yeah. a lot. I really like that because I I don't I, I want to compete against really good people and I'm seeing really good people pop up. And I'll, I don't have a clue whether he'll listen to this, but there was a guy called uh, Kieran Howells who won the UK DFBA uh, USN Classic as a junior. And he's probably one of the best juniors I've ever seen in the flesh ever. And he, like, he was awesome. Peeled, like, diced, great posing. And just, act, like, they didn't even compare him. They didn't even compare <laughs> him to it. Because he stepped on stage. He stepped on stage and he just closed the door. That's all he did. That's, he just, oh. I, I think it was epic. It was so cool because I, that's what I want to do one day. I want to step on stage and I don't, I don't even want there to be a question. I just want to close the door and that's it. And that type of domination, like, is that's that's super cool to me so again that's why shows are awesome because i wouldn't have i wouldn't have even even heard of this lad i've just seen the pictures and to be honest i've seen like there was a few pictures that went up of him they don't do him justice like in the flesh it was another level um so yeah there's lots of things but mainly 
mainly social media and like like as like we said going to the shows i think it's quite interesting that you brought up social media because uh, i have the feeling that nowadays social media gets kind of demonized the whole mm. time that it only has negative influences on people and i think quite the contrary is actually the case that it is only dependent on the mentality of the uh, user itself how mm. you actually look at social media if you treat it like the gold standard that everything is only there and everything has a negative impact on it of course you will only see the negative in the world or on social media itself but if you use it to motivate yourself may it be like you're watching i don't know pumping iron on on youtube or anything like that or some some big guys just lifting mm. weights i mean that motivates me as well and i mean when you then go over to some insta chick profiles i don't know i mean if that is kind of the motivation you need to make some progress and to stay on track that's absolutely fine and i have to increase feeling... the testosterone yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely uh, that's what i wanted to point out and um... a, a point on social media as well is like they say a lot of people will say in like the ifbb and things like that They say our oh, bodybuilding is dead because there's no like WIDA contracts or anything like that anymore. Like in the, in the back in the day, if you listen to some interviews with like older bodybuilders that like uh, like the WIDA magazines would sponsor, they'd be getting paid like something like eighty thousand pounds a year for like a contract and three thousand pounds for like guest posing and things like this. Whereas that's not there anymore, so they consider bodybuilding as just like that is dead or dying and that's actually i t i think to the contrary of that it's just the bodybuilders that are, are, are saying that are the ones that aren't investing in social media because the ones that are like the big ifbb bodybuilders that are investing in social media are probably making a lot of money and probably way more than the old reader contracts would give them so i think for bodybuilding as a sport social media is 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 incredible and some of the Some of the guys that were were bodybuilders or started off just as bodybuilders have now sort of like transitioned into this social media influencer fit guy. Like Matt Ogus just started as a bodybuilder. He was just competing and just mm. vlogging his journey. He started his YouTube channel as a response of doing a natural bodybuilding prep with 3DMJ. And now he's not so heavily invested in bodybuilding, which you can kind of tell. Mm -hmm. And he's more so invested in creating this brand, this Matt Ogus brand and, and selling these. Actually, they look r like really good products that he's starting mm -hmm. to create now. And he's just capitalizing on this huge like social media presence. So, yeah, I think for me, it, if social media is on one hand, like it's really positive and I try and use it for myself in a positive way, like I know you do, AJ, like sharing value. Sure. And the only time I find negatives in it for myself is when it makes me question my own process that I'm going through. So mm -hmm. at the moment, something I'm battling is I'm that person, like if you think about exams, I would revise as many hours as I possibly could in a day to try and do as well as I could on that exam day. And I wanted to outwork everyone. And that yeah. was just like revision time. That was who I am. So I'm all about doing as much work as possible and so right now it's kind of like putting my foot down on the brake while like mm. trying to charge forward like at the start of a race because I seriously want to start dieting but I know yeah. I've spoken I, I know we spoke a while ago about my conditioning and like I looked like I was pretty close to stage and I'd be ready probably far too early if I'd start really? dieting yeah. I've spoke like I've had you reassure me I've spoken to Evan Godby who I respect his opinion showed him Jared Feather, Mike Isratel, and Pascal. And those are kind of the people I referred out to. I haven't asked anyone else. Yeah. And it's kind of like right now, it's not all about working harder. And like sometimes pulling back and controlling things is kind of what you need to do. Because I think there are elements within, bo especially bodybuilders, who just want to work really, really hard. And they see someone online who's like shredded, maybe even doing their show. And they're like, oh, I need to now cut my like calories harder do more kind of cardio whatever it might be and mm. there's an element of trusting that process and i think you've done really well to have done that because well actually we haven't gone over i did look back and i think you were on episode uh nine so it's okay. been almost 10 weeks um oh, wow. so it's been quite Longer a while I thought. wow okay interesting 
So has your kind of nutritional, have you changed much with your macros kind of in the last few weeks or with your, tra- like with your nutrition, obviously your training has stayed pretty level. Yeah. Um, have you kind of, cause there's been, you've had quite consistent weeks, but you had that kind of stumbling block. And I think sure. sometimes there's like a whoosh that comes and people sure. don't hold out for that and they end up buying themselves in, in the yeah. back. Um, yeah. Have you, kind of been able to hold on and not push too yeah. hard or did you end up pushing and it worked out okay yeah so it's interesting you say that because i actually have got a post going out tonight on my facebook page that's literally this it's about sort of like making changes too fast and just like wasting away your ammo because yeah. we've got to essentially think of like contest prep or fat losses as like a, a battle for i know pascal loves analogies so it's like a battle and <laughs> you've got you've got a limited amount of ammunition so if you just throw away all your ammunition you you won't you won't get to win the fight and win the battle so i 10 weeks ago uh i'm not too sure as to my exact numbers but i reckon they were around about the 380 carb 55 fat and 200 protein mark i reckon if i was to look through my sheet they might have been a bit lower than that they might have been closer to 350 carb um, because I know that I was on 350 carb, 50 fat, 200 protein for like five weeks and just consistently losing. And I had a deload, which I know you guys chatted about in the last episode in terms of deloading or diet breaking, like when you sort of, sort of have a, like a lifestyle event or something going on that's going to interrupt things and, and planning accordingly to that. So I didn't plan accordingly, I'll be honest. <laughs> but I, but it worked in a way that was nice and that looked like I planned accordingly, which is cool. <laughs> so I deloaded the week before body power. And then when body power was on, it was like I was away like Friday, Saturday, Sunday kind of thing. And I had to meal prep a load of meals on the Friday. And it was just a rush. So trying to fit in a hard lower body session on that day would have been just, that would have just ruined me at that point as well. Before that deload, I think I felt the worst I'd felt this entire, like entire prep, because I was I was probably decently overreached because mm. I'd had a long training block, things had progressed really really well. I did push volumes up a little bit more in the final week and a half, and that yeah that that just fried me off. So I did definitely need that deload, and when I came back after that, it's just been nice nice and fluid motions, and then. With regards to changes, I've only made one change and to nutrition, and that was 350 carb to 330. I just took away 20 because I knew that my body responds quite well. I think I've got like, if you were to describe my metabolism, it's not very adaptive because I don't, when I make changes, it happens fast. I, there's a change that will like elicit a good response, but it will elicit that response for quite a while. And mm-hmm. I see some people who you put in a change like that, and it will make it will make good progress for one to two weeks, um, which you normally wait. You're patient, and then after that, it's just fucking nothing left in that change. You have to make another one, mm-hmm. and this is like the disadvantage of having potentially quite an adaptive metabolism as as we call it, because on the way up, you have to continue to eat more and more and more and more to gain. I think these may be on the way up. You're kind of quite like that because I know that you've been pushing food and not really gaining, but it's kind of correlative with water (laughs) weight and things like that as well. Yeah, it's really hard to know in such a short period of time, but yeah, you're right. I think, I think I do adapt upwards. Mm. I don't know about down. It's really hard to identify sometimes. Yeah, I don't know whether people have differences in down to up because I, th- I think the general conception is that if you've got an adaptive metabolism, it's the same on the way up or down, but I don't know. Um, I've I've generally seen that, like if they're adaptive on the way down, they'll be quite adaptive on the way yeah. up. And so, yeah, I, I, I made that change to 330 and that's, that's got me through. Like I've just, nice. the thing is when... And I'm still on that now. When I when I see a week, like a good week, I am sometimes tempted, guys. Like I'm sometimes <laughs> tempted just to pull another 10 grams. Yeah. Oh. I'm like, I could easily eat one less rice cake pre-workout, or I could easily I could easily drop tw- 10, 20 this grams out of this. And I just get really tempted because I'm like, 
what if I get to Wednesday and things aren't moving? And then I second guess myself and I get very anxious about it. And that's something that you should just like, when you're coaching yourself, which I am, and I know that Steve is, uh, you, you've got to like, you've got to think about things and just think, okay, is, is this change going to do what I want? And what would I do as a coach? Always think, what would I do as a coach? Yeah. So some, what I do is on a Sunday when I do, you know, the majority of client updates as well as mine, I do, I, I look, I open up my sheet and I no longer look at it as my sheet. I just pretend that this is a client update. I just no longer look at my name at the top of the sheet. I just completely ignore it. I look at the numbers. I look at the data. I obviously take into account how I feel, which is very important as a coach. But then I just I, I, I make changes or I decide on next week macros and cardio just from a coaching perspective. And that, that's it. And then I just leave it. I don't think about it anymore because if I think about it and double think about it, triple think about it, and quadruple thing. <laughs> I'll be like, I'll be like, bruh, like, uh, should I really make a change here? So, but it, I think, it, you sorry, can overthink it. Go for it, go for it, Pascal. <laughs> Did you say fat? Go for it. <laughs> um, no, but I think that this is something that many people don't, I mean, the skill of self coaching and being able to lay off that athlete mode and step into the coaching mode in that that time when you look over the data i think that many people can't actually do it and mm. this is something you need to develop over time if you really want to coach yourself and sure. i've seen uh, really good athletes who weren't really able to uh, decipher or step into switch between the coaching mode and the athlete mode and always that there was kind of an emotional decision at the end which is counterproductive i think Mm. Um, and in terms of adjusting your macros and, and uh, not taking the fast approach, what I would like to know is when it comes to your clients or perhaps you did something like this in the past, have you ever started more aggressive and then pulled back towards the show or have you always or are you always taking a more conservative approach, decreasing the macros over time into the show? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, good question. I, with clients that come to me, and Steve will know this because sometimes I've got a second opinion off Steve on some of these things. So I've had some this year that I think, wow, okay, like I might need to rush this first half just to get enough off to get them in a position where we mm -hmm. can start then slowing things down. Because uh, I think the general idea is that if you want to do a bit of rushing, you should do it at the start, then do it at the end. And that's just kind of correlative with training performance and your ability to retain muscle. If you're rushing, rushing off sort of body, body weights at the end, you're going to risk more muscle loss than you would if you did it at the start when you're a bit fatter. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I've done it a few times, but I don't like doing it. And I'll be honest that I've turned away like a decent amount of people this year because I'm just like, you're, you, we're going to have to rush. You're going to get into, into, into a position where you really just don't like the bodybuilding process. And a lot of the people that I get are like first-time competitors. Mm -hmm. So if you're a first-time competitor and I take you through what is a savage prep, I'm like, yeah, you, you're not going to like bodybuilding anymore. And that's horrible. Like I don't want to take that away from them. And if anything, I try to, you know, with the younger competitors, I know what it's like. And I know what it's like to push, have a job, do studying and things like that. And actually, when I went to a 3DMJ seminar back in, yeah, last year, I asked Brad and Nunez in the underground when I bumped into them. I was like, <laughs> I, I, I was like, I. I was like, guys, I prep a lot of like younger athletes, like teens. At the time, I was working with two teens. And I was like, D do you push them as hard as your other guys? And like, do you get worried about them being a bit softer because you can't push them as hard? Because you're, you know, you know, it's their first time. You don't want to put them off the whole process. And, but you still want to get them in good shape. And he was like, it was like, yeah, like I don't generally like I don't push them anywhere near as, as much as I would like an older, more experienced competitor. And that's half the time because they don't have the muscularity to get as lean or look as lean 
and I remember in 2015 comparing myself to like Nunez and like I was like in terms of conditioning I was like no like I don't have the muscularity and mm-hmm. I still have to remind some of my clients of that whether it be female or male that most of the time when you're comparing yourself conditioning wise to other people you have to take into account muscularity because muscularity will breed the look of a con- of a conditioned person if you mm-hmm. have the muscle there it'll look different to someone that's under muscled so like that's a hu- that's a huge thing as well just just people second guess that and don't realize how important muscularity is when it comes to achieving a look so people can even i'll just relate that people can think of that like skinny guy who has like abs but it's like 10 percent. but he doesn't look like he's 10 percent. and then mm. someone could be like 15 percent body fat with abs muscles he looks leaner but he's like five percent more body fat just because he has yeah. muscles so yeah, people will be no. able to relate it to that and also on the note of pushing it hard i mean uh, mike israel has the theory of when you uh, of training age plays a role in retaining muscle mass the longer and more experienced you are the easier it is to hold on to muscle mass while dieting and i Mm. think that the younger you are if you're stepping on stage for the first time i don't really see the necessity of pushing it hard because Mm. first and foremost it should be a joyful experience this stands above all in my experience in my in my opinion Mm. um because you can set them up for yeah Get going out of bodybuilding or not loving the sport eventually if you push it too hard and that's not actually the goal of stepping on stage uh, altogether and yeah then on the other hand as mentioned with the retain retention of the muscle mass when you're young and uh, if we keep that theory in mind then perhaps pushing it too hard might end up losing too much of muscle mass in the end, which then would be counterproductive because uh, you're stepping on stage and you want to actually hold and present the best package and as much muscle mass on your frame as possible. And when you then push too hard, you will end up being wrecked mentally and also not in the best conditioning possible. Yeah, I'd also add to that once you've lost body fat stores they become easier to lose or at least that's another theory i've heard so then the more kind of you look more conditioned or you have that kind of i forgot what it's called like muscle maturity look and that conditioning because you've actually kind of every time you diet and you get super lean you've kind of removed extra fat stores that you haven't removed before so every time you diet you should effectively be able to get like minor details that you haven't been able to achieve and before because it's like clearing it out almost yeah no both, worries gone on both theories make actually sense when you look at really experienced bodybuilders who are in the 40s or 50s yeah, how yeah. hard and dry they are actually looking this dry. isn't a look you you see with young guys. And, no. Uh, what what do you say? No, <laughs> dry. I just love the word dry. Yeah. I just, I just, uh, I just, I, I, I understand the term, wet. but yeah, it's like, what is the other? Like, are you wet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Soggy. Squishy. Yeah, squishy. <laughs> so we've actually got to a good point here, guys. I because we could go on too far here. We start saying moist and we lose <laughs> listeners because that's like the worst, the worst <laughs> term ever. Um, we've kind of gone to the point that we wanted to talk about body fat distribution. So AJ, you touched on how like your upper body is looking like it's pretty much looking stage ready in some parts, like mm. for sure. Whereas the lower body is kind of looking, I don't know like five weeks out compared to the the upper body which Great. i've definitely experienced similar for my first show like my my quads didn't really ever come out my glutes for whatever reason at least on one side are like they're pretty much shredded just like without <laughs> having to try very hard um but my back is like night and day my front you'll look at me and they'll be like oh yeah he looks close to stage i'll do my back shots I'll be like whoa like this guy is still like quite far out so i've definitely experienced that myself and i don't know about pascal you might touch on some areas where you hold on to it more than others and i guess you're kind of getting to that stage where you're getting that lean i guess i mean basically what you're saying is that (laughs) aj is looking like a (laughs) centaur the Um, the man horse (laughs) (laughs) or a mermaid mermaid, yeah yeah. (laughs) Uh, yeah for me i mean my lower body is actually uh 
getting more looking ready than my upper body is uh and which is quite quite funny and my front is holding more fat than definitely my back especially in the upper half of my back um, i'm getting more definition but when it comes to my legs and my lower body it's quite the contrast to you aj that i'm holding more fat in my upper half in the front i think i really need to get down to uh, quite significant body fat levels before i see a clear definition in my abs and when it comes to my legs for example i can already see start to see now some definition going on there um but yeah i i don't know tell us about oh, well, i was just yeah. gonna say we, all we need to do is spot fat reduce isn't it yeah why, why haven't we tried this <laughs> we just need to reduce spot of our fat oh gosh increase reps increase <laughs> reps increase time under tension on the body parts that are ready Absolutely. to sort of lagging behind Absolutely. i'll just um, in, bin sit bags. on the adductor machine or the abductor <laughs> machine it, it is the worst machine ever i think yeah i don't yeah i don't I especially don't when they are located in front of each other and you face <laughs> each other they do that that's 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 poor that's just the gym you go to. Jesus Christ. i just imagine um, you are sitting on the other side and there's a chick on on the other machine and you're just creeping the fuck out of her especially in that hat mate yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ. um what i was thinking about is uh i was just like while she was chatting i was thinking about how it, this could potentially affect muscle retention in terms of training performance and leverages because if you think about it if you've got like so pascal holds more fat in his upper body than me like for me my like my 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 thoughts are is that when he's doing movements like a low bar squat or a high bar squat with the bars on his back and he's still got some of that cushioning or likewise on a bench press when he's sort of setting up his arch and he's still got some of that cushioning to bring obviously that reduces range of motion when you lose loads of back fat you're slightly further down on the bench so rom is increased i think that that could potentially be a small little thing that could affect things like how the bar feels on your back i know there's a certain point when i get lean enough that that anything anything above 140 kilos just feels not good on my back like the heavy stuff now it feels just not 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 like good anymore it feels heavy as soon as i unrack it but as soon as i do a rep with it I'm like, okay, this is actually a weight that I can still shift for these numbers. It's just the bar feel is completely different. So I think I think that could be a factor. But also, like we were discussing off air, is the the idea of like if you have quite even body fat distribution, which some people do, it it, it almost makes progress more more sort of easy to look at and analyze because you get a more general conception of where you're at. This probably could provide more benefit to first-time competitors than people who are more experienced because, like with myself, we we're talking about off air, I know when my lower body is coming out. I know where I'm at, and I'm confident that when I do lose these next few pounds, it will get to a point where it's ready. But for a first-time competitor, they could think, I don't know how much I've got left to lose here, and I know that my upper body is really, really close, do I do a show now? Do I wait until my lower body comes in? When's it, when's it going to come in? It's a bit more stressful. Like that can increase stress more as well. Like, and that's another concept. But I think that if you're an individual that's blessed with quite even or favorable body fat distribution, it, it could be an, adv an advantage for you to get on stage and, and, and for you to sort of measure your progress in a more efficient manner i'm not sure what your guys thoughts are on that i think i just want to say i think this is really interesting because it's like some people you could actually come where, where it could be easier is this person could come to stage at an actual higher body fat percentage because Overall, they've got yeah. it even yeah because it's evenly spread they might not look like they're higher body fat percentage but they could be and that could mean that they actually feel better their performance is better they retain more muscle tissue whereas someone else might have to like go really low to eventually like the upper body could be like as low as it could possibly go like three percent to get their legs to a four percent whereas the other person could be like four percent all over and be absolutely fine or something along those lines um yeah do, anyway do you Pascal, think you 
Do you oh, think, sorry, just to interrupt and kill Pascal's moment, <laughs> um, oh, do you no. think that it would be advantageous for an individual to, if they have body parts or areas that are really sort of behind in terms of body fat, do you think it'd be advantageous for them to give it more time so that they can get those body parts lean, like really shredded, and then fill back up? the body parts that you've had to drag a load of fullness off. I know this is ideal in any sort of retrospect, but for those individuals that have those areas, like me with my legs, I'm looking at it and thinking, would it be beneficial for me to get those body parts as lean as possible and then bring up calories to try and fill back up my upper body whilst trying to maintain the body fat levels that I've got in my lower body? Do you think that would be you know, probably an advantage for those people? I think I think you nailed it with your like it's the ideal scenario for anyone. Anyone, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Just more important, probably more important for those people. Um, yeah. I think that probably happens to me the same. Like I don't know how it will go this year because my legs seem to be leaner than usual at this stage, yeah. which is really more cool. developed but my, as well. Yeah, my upper body just loses size like just as soon as I deplete. So it'll be interesting, but yeah, definitely, I think most people. Um, what what body parts do you sort of find go flat or go or diminish away when you're sort of digging deep into a contest prep? Like what what body parts would you look at and think, oh, okay, yeah, I'm definitely like looking quite flat now when you are flat. It's re- it, for me, I I actually personally find it's hard to identify. Oh, okay, I don't know if I'm not objective enough or if I don't look out for it well enough. Um, but I think mostly it's my arms, chest, and delts. Um, oh, probably because cool. I, I wouldn't notice it in my back because I it's hard to actually assess that without like checking properly yeah um, I don't really notice it in the legs I think partly because even when you like when you pump the legs they then lose a bit of definition and so it's kind of like a bit of a to and fro so yeah like biceps chest and delts what about when you're in, sorry this is complete wrong but what about <laughs> when your energy expenditure is really high I know that you do you did a lot of lists what like did your quads take a hit out of that did you lose any sort of sweep and do you think that the amount of lists that you were doing and hit were quite so like some of the the, like that impact on your quads do you think that that potentially was like promoting some cell swelling or some acute soreness in your quads that was hiding some definition or just made them look because you were really really conditioned i have an idea that like when you are really, really conditioned, you just you're hammering away at the energy expenditure. Lots of walking, lots of lifts, potential hit, leg training. All of this just batters your legs. And I've found that like when my I have a really high step day, I will lose um uh, like sweep quad sweep. My quads won't look at that blocky look that they have when they're when I'm off my feet more. So I think that is that something that you've experienced at all on or not with your list. <laughs> Your I would say as a as a competitor in 2014 I was so kind of inexperienced with it all that I probably didn't even think about it I kind mm. of was robotic in that my coach gave me this list it gave me this hit and I just went out and did it and I didn't really look at oh I'm looking like worse it was all about scale weight change and seeing that come down um, because I had a weight category that we were aiming for and I don't think that helped me at all because I think yeah I think I lost size i i know i was holding on to a bunch of water weight through kind of stress because post show i basically like i did that reverse diet like it wasn't like a strict reverse diet but i did that approach and i lost weight like the first two weeks and i was eating more and more and then weeks after that i was just maintaining so i reckon i just lost a load of stress those like first few weeks Mm -hmm. um and i wish i wish i could go back now and like have a look at what I was doing or like have more knowledge and go back because yeah, I just didn't even, there was probably so many lessons and takeaways from it where I didn't, I was just completely ignorant to it. Um, whereas now like we know so much more and we're so much more kind of, yeah, we're in the know now. So it's going to be way more interesting. Mm. Pascal yeah. opinions. <laughs> yeah. And first I want to touch on that list thing if that has an impact on your quads or the looks on your body and i would say that if you do true lists and you don't do it uh (laughs) excessively like walking the whole day it shouldn't really interfere or have an an impact on your body composition 
uh, when it comes to hit though hit and normal resistance training share the same adaptations in your body which then of course can ha um, interfere with each other and have an impact on your body composition in general and also on your stress yeah. levels and all that kind of stuff but if you're doing yeah again list not extensively i don't think that it will have such a high impact it could of course be a cell swelling because you're walking there's blood flow going into your cells and thus at one day making it appear a little bit bigger while on the other day it isn't mm. um, and in terms of performance and the the uh, retention of muscle mass along the way uh, it is i want to go back to that topic you brought up in the beginning because i think it's quite interesting and we can see it in power lifters quite often when they are cutting for a lower weight class sure. that most of them aren't really aware of how much of an impact the change in uh, their overall weight has on their technique and the mechanics of a lift as well thus i mean when you are losing a lot of weight only on your upper body as you've pointed out in the bench press your shoulders are closer actually closer to the bench itself you don't have that much fat around your chest anymore thus you need to travel a little bit uh, longer but you can't really handle that much weight anymore and i mm. think that this difference already can have an impact on your performance and strength in general and as we know that resistance training is the most essential key to retain muscle mass while we are cutting yeah um when we are not or when we need to drop the weight that significantly i could potentially see that we are losing a little bit of muscle mass along the way because we can't really have or retain that intensity i think lyle mcdonald's theory is to retain muscle mass there needs to be a um a threshold of intensity to actually retain yeah. it and i also think that um what's it called again um I, I've, I've missed the name but um, when it comes to the minimum effective dose you need to actually retain muscle mass while being at maintenance um, when you are injured or anything is one third to one fourth of volume but when it comes to intensity and i think when it comes to contest prep itself over weeks and weeks continuing to handle lower weight i think that this could potentially cause you to lose quite significant amount of muscle mass in a specific body area thus yeah. leading again back to the uh, point you've made that the people who are having a quite distributed fat um, distribution in general over the body um, that they are kind of blessed because i think that the mechanics of a lift w will not change as significantly as when you are um, losing fat I had a specific body part mostly first and then the other bo uh, body parts come in afterwards and i think that um there's it's a good theory you came up with in terms of that this could have an impact on the performance and also on yeah the overall look how you will look on stage how much muscle mass you potentially lose along the way because um just to give an example when it comes to my training my squats take a massive hit while I'm cutting simply because I don't have the cushion around my um, hips anymore. Thus, I can go so much more deeper before I get really that bounce and stretch reflex. And I'm squatting high bar and I'm, I'm really always trying to get the full range of motion. But then I really need to bring down the weight on the bar, which definitely has, a, has an impact on how much intensity or weight I can uh, handle there sure. and I could see that um, as soon as I'm getting really close to stage weight that my lower body perhaps suffers a little bit when it comes to muscle mass yeah yeah I don't know if I fully agree um, only because I'm thinking the muscle is now being stressed under like a greater range of motion um, and so the actual tension the muscles receiving is probably like purport like you don't know what, what's changing there and I don't necessarily think heavier weights necessarily mean 
that you're retaining more muscle and i think absolutely that's not what i'm saying but i think you need to decipher what is more important in terms of holding on to muscle mass is it the range of motion or is it the intensity of the bar i'm not talking about uh half reps or anything like that but really you're stretching the muscles already are those five centimeters difference really more important to hold on to uh, the muscle mass than it is handling 10 or 20 kilos more on the bar and i think when we when we're looking at the overall volume you're doing and the, the total tonnage throughout the week throughout the whole mesocycle this adds up to a couple of hundreds even thousands of a tonnage being handled and i think that this will actually have a bigger impact on the, your muscle mass than the five Extra to range of motion. seven yeah. centimeters of range of motion i could argue that you are now using less weight so you can actually do more repetitions or you could recover from more sets so then there would be more volume via that so i'm i'm just put be like yes it. i'm just putting I could argue, to the whole I, i'm way. sorry this could <laughs> go back and forth but I, I could argue that um perception of weight is simply yeah again a perception of weight yeah the body doesn't know if you put on 200 kilos or 100 kilo it is only a perception of the intensity the body signals mm. thus when you actually need to handle lower weight the body doesn't really sense that it's only 120 kilos it does only sense the intensity thus it will probably still leave you pr pretty fried at the end of the day uh, also of course i mean when you're going from 300 kilo compared to 150 kilo squatter this is quite a significant difference but i think when it's an individual and the difference is only 10 to 20 kilos that it still leaves the person pretty fried and as uh, also we need to consider that you are getting leaner and that your recovery takes a hit on that note as well yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I don't really I, it, I those mean, are all the, theories I, I mean i think the take home is that as much as you can you need to try to standardize everything that you do because obviously the the whole argument here is that the with the rom changing that you need to now consider loading and intensity differences whereas if we could just keep things ideally as similar as possible then that would just breed an environment where you're only controlling intensity and volume which we we know Enough. how to control those things um but with rom chucked in as a response to leverages and and sort of force curves and things like that you, you, you i think it's quite easy to get a little bit too confused <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's, it's interesting. About weird minutia <laughs> yeah. yeah it's interesting how you do sort of comment on the hip the hip and the uh the the those sort of joints because i think that's probably why i'm able to retain my squat is because my legs are fatter so those sort of changes in rom and depth and sort of bounce and, and pop out of the hole i've still got them i've still got the trampoline out the bottom mm -hmm. because my my glutes still are holding a good amount of fat and so are my hips and and things like that so you know that could be a favorable thing for me but then again on like bench pressing moves like i'm like skeletal and like doing a chest <laughs> doing a chest supported row is like digging into my sternum it like absolutely kills it's horrible so um you know there's disadvantages and advantages everywhere i guess totally I guess it, oh, sorry on. what the fuck it sounds like i have a delivery maybe i'll <laughs> let you go talk then <laughs> yeah okay. um what, what do you want to say actually uh yeah i think it comes really down to the individual then and uh, um yes i think we we've talked about it in the past already that when you are coming out of a show that the body fat distribution kind of changes yeah have you experienced it in the past um what what are your thoughts on it yeah definitely i think you know, when 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 it does come back on, it certainly comes back on in weird areas. That's probably more so down to in the initial weeks, a lot of what you gain is primarily going to be water and glycogen weight. So it almost looks like you're gaining body fat in different areas when in reality you're probably not and you're probably just gaining sort of glycogen water retention in the areas that perhaps were like 
potentially not even the stubborn areas, which is what I found. Like when I came out of my contest prep, I found that I was gaining body fat in the areas that weren't stubborn. So my, my, my upper body, so my abs and my low back, and whereas my legs would stay really, really lean. I was like so totally confused by that. And I think a lot of people have commented with similar similar theories in that you you can sort of like the areas that were perhaps stubborn stay a little bit leaner for longer, and then the the areas that were sort of like the easier parts to get off gain potentially a ton of water, or glycogen levels, and maybe a bit of body fat as well. But and this is sort of seen in other people and other podcasts that I've heard on the topic is that when you do get deeper and sort of get into like at least two months of gaining, it does sort of just tend to sort itself out and you just look the same anyway. It's like the whole reverse diet concept because, you know, obviously the idea is that you're trying to adapt your metabolism up and eat more food and, and be looking sort of like stay a bit leaner. But at the end of the day, like you look sort of three, four months down the line, maybe even a bit further, people just end up in the same same place Mm. like as long as they don't go crazy you know that's why i think the the recovery diet idea came into fruition is because they were realizing that keeping these people dieting and keeping them suppressed for longer periods of time just wasn't actually achieving anything apart from like causing a load of horrible feelings (laughs) for like fucking ages and you just feel like shit so i think that um you know the body fat thing it's probably something interesting to note, and I'd I'd like to obviously hear more and more people's experiences. It'll be interesting to see sort of how you and Steve come out of your shows and and where you think you gain body fat in areas. But I know for a fact that my legs stayed leaner for quite a while than I would have initially expected, considering they were a sort of a, a more stubborn body part to lose from initially. Sorry about that, guys. I also had That's the same it. experience no. with my legs in terms of after my show, they stayed leaner. And now yeah. dieting down, they've got leaner quicker, which is really cool. And I was actually, I was going to touch on, and I think you kind of talked about it a little bit here, in terms of like body fat settling points in that, like if you perform well at a certain kind of, if you're just naturally lean, then you might perform well, retain muscle a little bit better than someone who's like, their settling points miles away from stage, then they okay. really struggle. And the same with like reversing some people, if they want to get to, if they know they settle well, like at a higher body fat percentage, they probably want to be a more assertive kind of recovery diet versus someone who is naturally a bit leaner. But um, yeah, sorry, Pascal Guys, is going to go. I, I have, I have an idea that <laughs> came up now um, oh God. because when you're <laughs> dieting for, for the first time to really low levels, you're probably still holding on to lots of visceral fat as well. So in between your organs, which then gets depleted or lost the closer you're getting to the show as well. Sure. When you're then coming out of the show and you regain lots of fat, have you ever had the feeling of that you are getting more subcontaneous fat along the way? So you put on quicker. I mean, you can't really shit up. Yeah, you look you look worse. So you 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 look at two body weights. So this would be interesting to compare pictures. So if you look at one fifty five, let's say, three weeks out, and you look at one fifty five three weeks post, one fifty five three weeks post looks way shitter. Yeah. And what like why? I, yeah, you just you, I guess you gain more subcutaneous, and you also pack on a little bit more water retention, maybe yeah. sodium's been higher, things like that. So always post, unless you do it in a, I don't know whether you could do it in a manner where it would look good, because obviously that that would maybe come with a slower, a really slow drip fed approach, which again, mm-hmm. just isn't necessary, but that's the only way I guess you could get that body weight to look similar or, or, or good. And like I, I could also imagine that the subcutaneous fat is easier to gain and also easier to lose. Thus, yeah, for yeah. future shows, it probably is like, as you've pointed out, Steve, your legs are now getting quicker shredded or lean. So mm. this was only an idea I now had that... Perhaps for the first show, your visceral fat is still 
a bigger part of your total uh, fat uh, percentage and when you're dieting then for the first show you need to lose a little bit more fluff because the subcutaneous fat gets released a little bit slower because the body picks from the visceral fat and the subcutaneous and when you're then uh, coming out from the first show you're putting out more subcutaneous fat which then gets easier uh, stripped off in the future yeah nice. I, i'm just going to put this out there i bet you it's genetics i bet they play a huge role in this i just <laughs> I, I i just bet they do they seem to influence everything guys yeah <laughs> yeah everything yeah everything. absolutely everything yeah. i think uh, <laughs> on that note <laughs> we've come to an hour yeah yes it was hopefully people awesome. have stayed with us stayed strong yeah, absolutely i mean i'm with, sure they have with the discussions perhaps. we had <laughs> yeah, so uh, back and forth i think we've never actually had some disagreements oh it's good that i'm glad that i, I think it's that yeah i think we just took i don't know if it was sometimes our disagreements are misunderstandings of our viewpoint i think we probably both yeah. agree to this yeah, I mean, uh, on the on the overall outcome so yeah, the but... outcome will always be in an agreement, I'm quite sure. Because <laughs> I'll say, for fucking hell, Pascal, do as I say. <laughs> <laughs> no, but AJ, thank you very much for coming on the show for a second no time. Uh, I wanted to have you here now that I'm actually uh, shaking off my be beard uh, so that we right. have images together here. Uh, <laughs> and, um, especially w when are you stepping on, uh, on the platform now? The platform. Uh, <laughs> uh, on not, on not, stage, sorry. The platform, not anytime soon. <laughs> um, the stage, 13th of August. So oh, just really? under nine weeks now. Holy shit. Yeah, we'll soon. have to get you on again. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't actually realize AJ is also doing, you are doing the yes. UK DFBA. Um, yeah, which be, I think it, the 30th of September. Yeah, yeah. Or... yeah. Yeah, if if I if I choose to definitely confirm for that one, the other option is a little bit sooner than that. But um, it's 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 such a long journey away that I don't think that's going to be feasible. The only issue with the UK DFBA the then is the fact that if I qualify for the British finals, the BNBF, it's a week after. Um, so oh. it's like shows back to back weekends, and one oh, of them I like. I really care about the BNBF finals if I if I qualify for that, and that's really important to me. Oh. Um, so a bit of redemption to be done there, because okay. I I continue to not not do as as well as I should do at British finals. So um, it's time to fix that this year. So uh, this yeah that 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 one hopefully I'll be at as well. Um, but regardless of whether I am or not, I'll you I know you guys are there and I'll be there watching so oh, epic. um because you know it's it's not that far away from me and I did it uh, it's, nice. a, it's the same venue that I was at this weekend so it's a nice venue oh cool yeah it's a nice venue cool easy to park as well and there's a black coffee shop sort of like <laughs> coffee shop <laughs> nice yeah uh AJ <laughs> when the people aren't aware of it already I'm quite sure most of them are where can people find you sure so I'm active on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. YouTube is much more active at the moment. So uh, my Instagram's AJ Morris underscore, which Pascal forgot when he was doing the intro <laughs> of this this video. And my yeah. YouTube's just <laughs> my YouTube's just AJ Morris. So you can search that. I do sort of like a few sort of point and shoot videos a week, and then aim to put up like a vlog if I go somewhere or do something interesting with my life, which sometimes happens. And then uh, what else? That's uh, Facebook. So Facebook is made by Morris Online Coaching, and that's very similar sort of stuff to Stephen Pascal in terms of like sort of daily Facebook posts and, and just sort of informative content on there. And uh, yeah, so go ahead and follow if you want to sort of like follow my journey and expect some more sort of like glute shots as the show gets closer, and that those will be fun. I was already surprised that I couldn't find you when I wanted to tag you in the post. <laughs> uh, complete, completely incorrect username yeah. uh, <laughs> I've definitely made the same mistake <laughs> yeah yeah skip that. I should just not have the bloody underscore it just makes no sense right <laughs> that's true uh, but we are making sure to put the links below uh, when you are guys watch it over at YouTube please make sure to leave a thumbs up leave a rating over at itunes this helps us massively i will always repeat that every single time we are doing the show from now on 
And other than that, guys, it was a pleasure talking to you. And um, yeah, do you want to say anything, Steve? No, I just want to say thank you to AJ. And definitely, if you enjoy our stuff at Revive Stronger, um, you'll love AJ stuff as well. And yeah, thank you guys for a good chat. And thank you for everyone for tuning in. We'll catch cool. you soon. Cheers, guys.